Blessings, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. And it is a great blessing that I have as my guest, Eduardo Lopez de Casas. See? Yes. <laughs> is that you right? Okay. Great. Yeah, you sent, uh, Eduardo sent me his biography. It's really, there were some fascinating things in here. So Eduardo is a counter tenor. Wow. That's yes. cool. Some people might not with that, know what that is. Um, I saw the counter tenor, um, what was his name? Andre Scholl. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah, I think he's yes. Austrian. Yeah. Yes. So, well, I mean, a counter tenor, what is a counter tenor? They can sing well, very, very in, high. Yeah. yeah, in layman's terms, it's just a, a man that can sing like a woman. Um, I call myself a counter tenor because that's really the only thing that people are going to be able to understand. But uh, I actually had five and a half octaves. So I uh, sing everything from bass to soprano. And uh, in my classical career, of course, sometimes I'm hired to sing the bass part in a Mozart mass. Sometimes I'm hired to sing the alto part. Sometimes I'm hired to sing soprano. Uh, but of course, that gets very complicated. So I just say I'm a counter tenor <laughs> and uh, people seem to understand that. Okay. <laughs> it's very, I, I, I love that kind of music. I love it. Great. Um, and gosh, you've, you've sang at a lot of, a lot of prestigious places. Um, you, you also are direct and uh, you're, you do staging, producing, theatrical productions. Wow. Musical yes. productions. Yes. Been and I, re I represent uh, artists from, from uh, South America when here in the United States. So I do artists like uh, we were talking about uh, Pedro Infante behind me, his daughter Irma Infante. I represent her here. And so I... Uh, when I bring her over, I usually am directing or conducting her concerts and doing her bookings along with other artists. Oh, and then Eduardo worked at two different parishes in the Galveston Houston Archdiocese for over 15 years. You were a musical director. At um, both parishes, yes. Uh, at uh, Prince of Peace Catholic Church in Houston, you became aware that your boss, Father John Keller, had yes. been of sexual abuse in the early 2000s. Father Keller was removed when the Galveston Houston uh, a, a priest was accused list was released and shortly thereafter the priest was also removed from the same congregation. Wow. After speaking publicly about your history of abuse um, at his parish, Eduardo told that his position there was no longer existed. Oh, wow. They fired you? Uh, well, they don't use those terms. I specifically was asking, am I being fired? And uh, the lady from uh, the diocese said, your position no longer exists. A nice so, way to put it. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what they told me. Wow. Um, Eduardo Lopez is a, a de Casas, is a 45 year survivor of sexual abuse and currently serves on the national board of SNAP, serving as a liaison to the Spanish speaking community and their particular issues. God bless you. Could you talk a little bit about what SNAP is? I think if people saw the movie um, Spotlight, they probably have heard, they've heard of it. But could, could you just talk a little bit about it? Yes, uh, in, in a nutshell, what we do at SNAP is uh, we are here to provide uh, self-help support to survivors. This is basically done through support groups throughout the country and actually throughout the world as we have now expanded into New Zealand, Japan, uh, various other countries now. Uh, that is our main focus with, with uh, survivors. We also are here to share resources and information amongst survivors that could help them, um, you know, with their uh, process, uh, if they have cases, or just simply help them survive from day to day, because many of our survivors, of course, are suffering PTSD, uh, alcoholism, drug use. Uh, so, you know, we try to help them as much as we can to exist on a daily basis with the burden of having been abused. Uh, we also uh, uh, organize for political actions uh, to challenge the institutional church to better deal with the problem of its uh, priests 
sexual misconduct. So uh, we encourage survivors uh, to join SNAP either for one of those reasons or for all three of those reasons or for whatever they may need. But mainly, um, I like to think that SNAP is here to be an ear to right. survivors because many survivors, when they um, call me, uh, they think they're the only one. And when they come to a support group and suddenly find that there's five or six people that had similar things happen, you know, it, it's such a sigh of relief when they say, oh my God, I'm not the only one that this happened to. <laughs> and immediately there's a level of comfort. There's a level of knowing I have found my home. Yeah. And, and survivors can, they can receive these services for free. It's, it's oh, yes. Free. Yes. Yeah. Everything, everything we do is, is done for free. And, uh, you know, and that's another thing that, you know, you have to consider that many of the survivors of sexual abuse because of drug use, because of alcoholism, because of PTSD, uh, it's very common that many of our survivors have had problems with keeping jobs. Uh, you know, they've had problems with keeping their families together. And so they are not the, the cream of the crop, the wealthy people that are coming to us. You know, they need help. And that's what we are trying to do is make sure that someone is helping them. The first step being just having someone listen to them. And um, these services, are, are they confidential and anonymous? So if someone um, contacts SNAP, they don't have to um, come out publicly as a, as a survivor. Yes, everyone is uh, treated and allowed to participate uh, through their own comfort zone. Even, for example, the meetings that I have, of which I had a support meeting last night, uh, when I have new people, like last night I had two new uh, survivors, and I always tell them beforehand, you, do not, you don't have to say a word if you don't want to. You can just simply listen in the meeting your first couple of times and listen to everyone else if you feel uncomfortable. I said, when the time comes and you feel you can add something, go ahead. If you never want to add anything, you don't have to ever add anything. You can just be there listening to what's going on. And yes, everything we speak of, of, of course, is, is confidential. It, it's not to go any further. Um, and uh, it's, it's worked very well. You know, we are the oldest uh, organization for sexual abuse in the United States, uh, the most active and the largest. We've been in existence for over 30 years. Now, someone, um, in order to contact um, SNAP, do they have to be a survivor of pre-sex abuse or is it just any form of sexual abuse? No, they, they, it just has to be someone in need, someone that needs somebody to listen to, you know, so, uh, one of the things that I think is uh, very interesting uh, through the pandemic is that I suddenly, I had, uh, I have more, more females now reaching out to me than males. So that has kind of shifted through the pandemic. Um, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just uh, females. Maybe they have the extra burden of, of now being at home and not working and taking care of children and, and then having the husbands at home. And, and I, I think it, it, it gets sometimes, you know, to the point where it's just too much to bear. But yes, through the pandemic, I, I found more females reaching out to me than males. Uh, and and uh, you don't have to be of the Catholic faith. Okay. Uh, and of course, they're not. I have people calling me that are Jewish, of the Jewish religion, of the Methodist, uh, Protestant, they're, they're all reaching out. Of course, also, I have a couple of uh, survivors of, of abuse in the scouts. Uh, and one of the things which I um, like to focus on because of my uh, experience is, you know, of course, uh, abuse in the schools. Mm. And so, yes, people call with all types of, of stories and all types of abuse from all types of uh, mostly figures in authority. And we're here to help all of them. Mm, thank you. God bless you. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. The one I, I wanted to give a little background um, 
about why I, I wanted to talk with you. We have a mutual friend and I was talking to him about, he's also a survivor and I was talking to him about some of the concerns that I had about the Spanish speaking community in the Catholic church. Uh, because I, I live, I live here in California mm-hmm. and California, I would say in terms of Roman Catholicism has mm-hmm. become predominantly Hispanic. Mm-hmm. I think, I mean, part of that is due to immigration, I think from Mexico yeah. and Central America, but um I think part of it has to do also with just the abuse crisis that a lot of Anglos um, have left the church, especially yes. my, my age. Um, I mean, I know very few people. And I mean, I went through 12 years of Catholic school and yes. I know very, very few people who um, are still Catholic, let alone attend church. Yes. And I, and I think the abuse crisis had a lot to do with that. So um, um the I don't know if you're familiar with this. It's called the Los Angeles Religious Education Congress. It's a big um, event in the Archdiocese yes. of yeah, Los Angeles, which is mm-hmm. it's the biggest. It's the a lot of people don't know this. They might think it's New York, but the largest archdiocese in the United States is Los Angeles. Yes, in terms of population, and a lot of that has to do with Hispanic community, mm-hmm. and. Um, so they have a, a religious education congress there every year, and I and I go. I haven't gone recently because of COVID. I don't know if I'm going to go back, but um, I used to go just because I had heard about certain programs that they had there with dealing with gender identity and sexual orientation. And I was curious about. I mean, and this is a space that I move in. I used to move in. I'm not Roman Catholic anymore. But that I used to move in in the church, and I was curious about what was being taught there. And um, when I did go to some of those those lectures, I was concerned because um, priests and lay people and religious were telling you know other priests, lay people, teachers, um, Catholic school teachers, you know, when they go home to their home diocese, you know, to have conversations with young children, very young children, second, third grade about gender identity, sexual orientation. That was very concerning to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, considering the Catholic Church's track record, the abuse of children. And um, and I, so in in subsequent years, when I went, I kind of, I didn't like protest, but I used to hand out leaflets to people. And Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, some of these things that are being recommended here are concerning. And I, and, the Los Angeles Religious Ed Congress is interesting because you have a large, I wouldn't say large, I, I would say the, the population of attendees is sort of divided. You have about half that I say are older, quite older Anglos, female. And then you have a younger group that is Hispanic, um, much younger, much more enthusiastic. Yes. Um, but also after having conversations with them, I'm generalizing much more trusting of the hierarchy, much more willing to believe whatever a priest or bishop says as, is, as the truth, less, much less willing to question. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was very concerning to me because these programs about um, gender identity and sexual orientation were, were also um, taught in English and then they also have a Spanish, a bilingual program. So I thought this is very concerning to me. So not only are they hitting Anglos, but they're also hitting the Spanish speaking community. And I'm like, this is not good because I am concerned that, and I was wondering if you could talk about this, that I think there's a tendency, especially in the migrant community, I, I would say less so in like a, the next generation. Um, what I've looked at studies is a lot of times the second and third generation of Hispanic Catholics, a lot of times leave the church Mm -hmm. or don't practice. But I would say in the the original migrant population, there is a trust of the Catholic church. There's a trust of priests. There's a trust of bishops, which I wouldn't say is necessarily a, a horrible, bad thing, but I think it can create an environment where abuse can take place. Yes. Well, that was that was a lot. Sorry, sorry, Eduardo. That's a lot. Uh, 
So since you did give me a lot, what specifically do you, would you like me to target first? I would say what what do you I mean what are your what are your thoughts about what I said about the Hispanic community that at Catholic specifically about I that there might be certain dangers there especially where the migrant community is very mm -hmm. trusting of the Catholic Church and I've seen this happen in my area where um, children first generation children are abused yes. Spanish speaking because there is a, a very deep reverence, I think, for the priesthood and for the church, I think that a lot of times is missing in the Anglo community because they've really been through the, the abuse crisis in the United States where maybe a migrant hasn't seen that yet. Well, I would like to enlighten you a little bit. Okay, go ahead. I tell you that in reality, I think a lot of the uh, Central and South American countries, uh, they have they have actually witnessed more definitely Peru, yeah, of the children than what we have witnessed here. The only thing is the difference is that uh, number one, homosexuality is still a very taboo thing. Uh, all of your male victims or the majority of your male victims that have been abused in those countries uh, are not really going to want to tell their stories or say what happened to them when they were children because number one if you've been sleeping with a man uh, everyone assumes that then you are gay and uh, with the machismo that comes with the latin american countries that's just something that you're not going to do in your community is even if you were, you know, raped uh, physically by a priest or by a, an adult in, in an authority figure, you're not going to go out and tell the world, you know, a man had his way with me. Because again, it's so taboo still. And, and people don't, uh, people down there in those countries, they still have a problem differentiating, you know, being abused and being gay. Okay, and being straight. I understand that. So, Eduardo, even though there has been abuse in Latin America, it has not gotten the amount of, I'm asking you, it hasn't gotten the amount of press or attention like it has in the United States, has it? I mean, I haven't seen it or heard, except for Peru, where that bishop was. was definitely uh, not. Uh, you know, we saw with the case of Marcel Marceau. Yes. Uh, that uh, I just recently saw an interview that was conducted with uh, Pepe, which is one of the original accusers of him. And this interview was conducted 25 years after that, they're celebrating 25 years after he was denounced. And I'm gonna tell you, it's something that most Latinos need to watch. This, this victim is so articulate and so vibrant and so it's like watching your grandfather speak about abuse in such an open way and i think it's those things that will shock the uh, hispanic communities because they're actually watching someone that was abused it's very articulate and they're they're looking and saying yeah we kind of knew that was going on but some people might not know who marcel marcia is could you, could you talk well, again about uh, well, I mean, he, he was, uh, he, he ran a movement in South America and, and he was a prolific abuser. And so, of course, 25 years ago, he was denounced. So uh, this is a person that has left through, through the movement that he did down in, in Mexico, you know, hundreds of victims. Uh, and again, that's something that, he, you know, is, is so rare. It happens all the time, but it's so rare to actually hear, you know, hear this is an actual person in the church that was abusing children. And now we all know about it. The world knows about it. Everyone knows about it. But again, there's such a, such a, we have to differentiate. The world knows about it. The world around uh, Mexico, say, knows more about it than the, the residents in Mexico do. Because, number one, when you bring up those topics, nobody wants to talk about it, nobody wants to hear about it, and nobody wants to read about it. 
So all of us here in the United States, in France, in Germany, we all know what happened there. But, you know, we're, we're not in communication with the people that need to be told. And I'll also tell you that when you made reference to the Latino community there in Los Angeles, which is the same thing as, as say, the Latino community here in, in Texas or anywhere. Uh, in layman's terms, what happens is the church has uses the Latino community and just as priest groom young men and young women uh, to be able to abuse them. The church also does the same thing with the Latino community. Mm -hmm. And when I was growing up, for example, uh, in a strict conservative Catholic home, one of the things that I remember that that uh, was the most uh, the most prominent thing that I remember seeing, particularly when I was, you know, say, going through catechism, was pictures of uh, of the shepherd and sheep. Mm. Okay? And you grow up with that. You're you're it's ingrained in to you when 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 you're very small all you see is shepherd leading the white sheep and you know if he leads them up the hill they all follow if he leads them down the hill they all follow but here's the shepherd leading the sheep okay that is what the catholic church does right now with the latino community mm -hmm. the latino community are the perfect sheep they are perfect they don't ask questions they right. just follow they just follow whatever the the priest the bishop the monsignor the pope says they follow that was that was my yeah that was my observation yes. too yeah and uh unfortunately you know we need to help them start asking questions now uh going with that comparison that i just gave you uh people like myself okay in that scenario we are the black sheep we are the sheep that the church is like this sheep cannot be in the in the middle of the flock with all the white sheep we need to get rid of that that sheep and let it go in, in this case people like me it's okay for to lose the the sheep you know there's a famous story about the lost sheep right well for victims they don't mind us being lost they want us to be lost. And again, the thing about Catholicism and Latinos in churches, you have to put things in just those simple terms so that they understand what is going on and what's going on around the world and what's going on particularly with the, with the uh, Latino community, the immigrants and things like that. I will tell you another thing that, for example, the church is not dealing with, which is something that I try to emphasize here in Texas, because of course, just like California, since we're a border state here, um, dealing with survivors of sexual abuse here for you know many years and, and being a victim of sexual abuse myself, we all know very clearly that when a child has been abused, there are going to be signs of that abuse as that person grows up. Unfortunately, many of our victims, as I told you, turn to alcoholism, drugs, you know, the PTSD is there. Everybody's, you know, grows up every once in a while, no matter how productive you are, no matter how wealthy you are, something is always going to happen in your life that's going to trigger you. Yes. It can be a movie, it can be something somebody says, it can be a situation you're put in and you suddenly get triggered and suddenly you're a child again and you're being abused and there's nothing, you have no control over it. That's something that's going to happen. For very, the very, com very common. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'll also tell you this, this is another one of those problems that, that I try to emphasize here in Texas. We have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of children that have taken the journey from South and Central America here to the United States that our government has allowed to come into our country. Mm. Now think about it. These are children yes. that some of them, you know, three, four years old, some yes. of them babies, but the ones that are, are say three and above that actually can kind of see what's going on. These are children that 
in many cases have been taken away from their parents. They have done this long journey of, a, of thousands of miles, okay, to a, a different country with strangers. They get accepted into the United States, right? And then here, they're being distributed. If there's a family member, they get distributed to a family member. Many of them are not even being distributed to family members. They're just being sent all over the United States. You know, the one thing the Catholic Church doesn't seem to be saying is that these children, <sighs> 10 years from now, they're going to have problems. Oh. They have been separated from their family, their, their mothers. They're going to have PTSD. They're going to have the same things that these are our sexual abuse victims have. And nobody seems to care. We need to try, you know, the government needs to track these I, people and say I, and check on them in three years. See how Eduardo, are. Eduardo, I, you, you, you kind of jump. God bless you, though. You kind of jump to the other topic I wanted to, to discuss with you is I'm concerned about the migrant population coming across the border mm -hmm. because, yeah, there isn't oversight. And I think one of the the constants or, or something that's familiar to them in the United States would be the Catholic church. Yes. And yeah, I'm, I am concerned because I think migrant communities in general can be fearful of law enforcement. Yes. So can you imagine if somebody is abused in the Catholic mm -hmm. church, they're going to be, I mean, an abuse survivor or victim is already reticent to mm -hmm. contact uh, illegal, uh, legal authorities. But if yes. you're, if you're a migrant, you're really going to be reticent or yes. fearful about. So I think the Catholic church in a lot of ways with migrant children has the perfect victim. Oh, yes. they're, they're trusting, yes. they're fearful, and they don't want to contact legal authorities for any mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. It's, it's incredibly frightening. Yes. And, and also, Keep in mind that when someone is a predator, yep, they are going to look around and what they are looking for is who is vulnerable out there. It's horrible. And that's what happens. You know, these 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 Latinos, these Hispanics, they are vulnerable. They don't speak the language. They're scared. They're gonna follow and they're gonna keep quiet no matter what's done to them, they're going to keep quiet. Exactly. And wouldn't you say that in Latin America, <clears throat> I mean, I would say yes, that the Catholic Church still has, a, it, it's, I think it's, it's decreasing, it's fading, but still has a much more influential position in, in society and culture than in the United States. It still has an influential position, but again, uh, I'm going to, for example, target Mexico. Okay. okay. Uh, I do a lot of work there, but I'm also going to tell you that I, I'm looking at this, uh, you know, Mexico City with the, the shrine to Guadalupe. It's the second most visited site for Catholics under the Vatican. Uh, now, you have the problem with the cartels in, in Mexico. Um, to me, why is the Pope not stepping in and trying to do something about all the killings and the cartels? You know, he has all of this Catholic following there. He gets involved in everything. And he, right now he's, he's, he's trying to interfere in Ukraine. But the cartels, they're killing people in Mexico. This has been going on and on and on. Where is the Pope? Why is the Pope not interfering there and trying to, to save his flock? All I can think of is money. Yes, of course. Everything is about money. Everything that, that the church does. I was talking to someone yesterday who was in, uh, in a convent and uh, this uh, person was abused. Uh, and actually she's in, in California and she was abused and, and she put in a complaint along with, I think, six other uh, students female students that were at a convent uh and you know when she walked away from the convent of course uh she's an adult woman however she got involved in religious education when she was like 12 years old so from the time she's been 12 she's been living 
studying, getting, preparing to be a, a nun. So when she, they denounced a priest and she left, you know, she was telling me yesterday how, of course, she, she told the people at the convent, uh, you know, we don't have clothes. We don't have anything. We don't have cars. We, we, you know, we've been living in a convent for years, you know, are y'all going to help? Uh, and of course, you know, they gave her a little bit of money and then just basically sent her out into the streets. But she was telling me, you know, that every time she would ask for aid, you know, they would tell her there at the convent, you know, we don't have any money. We don't have any money. And what I was telling her is like, I can't understand why Catholics, even someone that's that's being trained to be a nun, that's taking all these courses for many years, that's in school, in the school atmosphere. I was like, why do people not think logically? I said, you are in an institution and you have to know that in your convent, if your convent, for example, ever closed, if your convent ever built an extension to their building, the Pope knows about this and has to approve these things. When a priest gets sent from anywhere to your convent, the Pope knows about this. He's told and he knows about this. I said, nothing happens here in your church, in your convent, in my congregation without the Pope approving this. I said, now, the Vatican that has probably the, the world's greatest uh, uh, collection of art, priceless things in the Vatican. I said, how come y'all don't ever turn around and say, okay, if, we, if this convent is broke, then why doesn't the Pope sell a piece of art and give us some money? You know, and it's just a shame because, you know, unfortunately, this is the, the church and, and, and what they're doing to people. For example, using their money for Catholic charities, which is going to these children that they're not keeping up with and things like that. Uh -huh. You know, the year before last, as you know, the church got billions of dollars in yes. loans from the government. Now, those are the, those, that's money that was supposed to go to small businesses around the United States. However, the Catholic church got billions. They had no shame asking for it, no matter how big the congregation is, no matter how well off it is, they took that money. That's tainted money. It's Including, tainted yeah, money. the Archdiocese of New York did a and lot, got a what lot. What I tell my friends here, and when I'm talking to different groups, I'm like, I'm sorry, but you don't realize it, but you may not go to a Catholic church, but you have put money in the basket that they're passing around every Sunday. Because when those PP loans were handed out, that is your tax money. And now it's been given to the Catholic Church. Believe it or not, several months ago here in Houston, we have a church called Lakewood, which is called, the, they say it's the largest church in the world. Uh, Joel Olstein is the, the preacher there. Well, just a few months ago, uh, Joel Olstein and his largest church in the world there, they took $4 million in PPP loans. However, he was pressured by his congregation and by, I guess, the city and by many people about the $4 million. Well, a few months ago, they gave the $4 million back. Good, to good. The government. Good. And of course, I'm like, okay, so where's the Catholic Church? What are we well, giving back to the nothing, government? Nothing, no way. No, and they've already spent that, those billions of dollars, I'm sure. And, and they don't feel guilty about it. Oh, are they you They don't feel guilty about it at all. No, 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 no. This is another thing that um, consmer, concerns me about the Spanish-speaking community in the Catholic Church is that um, there's a lot of money flowing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the Catholic Church has a history of this. I mean, we had different waves of immigrants into the United States. I mean, specifically in the U.S., you had the Irish and you had the Italians. And these, these immigrants, largely, you know, not particularly educated, you know, really funded the church. Mm -hmm. And specifically in California, this is taking place with the Hispanic community. I remember in my own diocese, there was a priest, uh, a Hispanic priest, who got in, it was a very bizarre circumstance, was got in a car accident. And during the investigation of the accident at the scene, 
mm-hmm. the police found tens of thousands of dollars of cash in his car and then at his home. Yeah. Because, I mean, I have a lot of wow. Hispanic friends, Spanish-speaking friends, and they tell me that, I mean, I ran a business too, and I loved my Hispanic customers because they usually paid in cash. Mm-hmm. You know, Americans, everything's credit. So, yeah. um, you know, friends have told me that in the Catholic Church, there's a lot of cash flowing around in yeah. terms of the Hispanic community. And this is very concerning because it's, it's there's no concerning. there's no accountability. Because um, what has happened is uh, in in countries where where you have gang violence, um, you know, Colombia and now in Mexico, of course, which is the the capital now, you have a lot of the the wealthiest of families that have moved here to the United States, and of course, you know, we're a mecca here in Houston, as you are in Southern California for these people. Well, of course, they go, they establish themselves, and they go to a Catholic church. And what you see or what happens in the Catholic church now is you're seeing these families that, uh, you know, they don't put $5, $3 in the basket. They'll drop two $300 bills in there. And, of course, to the church, it's like, you know, that's, that's manna from heaven. They're getting money. And they're doing so many things that, again, the problem is, you know, is the Catholics just don't ask questions. They're not logical. Uh, one of the things that that has that I'm very concerned about is, um, you know, some of the reforms that I've asked for here, and I'm asking our Cardinal Daniel Donardo, who is a very controversial figure in the church and refuses to meet with us. Um, I've told him, you know, with everything that has happened, why do they have overnight retreats with children? Oh, Okay, but see, my problem is, why do the parents allow this? Be- the parents because are not concerned. They about trust. It. They trust. Yes, they trust. Yes, they do. And then the other thing that is that is really interesting about this, because I was talking to some people that weren't even aware about this yesterday. I told them the thing is, for example, in confirmations, I have a great niece, and we would not let her go on the overnight retreat, so she was refused her confirmation. <sighs> that's going on and i don't understand how people can have this stuff going on and still be catholic and still entrust their children to this institution i think a lot of times until and i'm not judging anyone because mm-hmm. you know my my dad i'm first generation american my dad's from from sicily mm-hmm. so they were very trusting of the Catholic Church, especially when they were new to this country. Like you said, they didn't speak the language. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad went to a church that had Italian masses. So that was your instant community. And yes. you felt you felt safe, you felt protected, and, and you trusted. Yes. And I think a lot of times until something bad happens to you or to somebody mm-hmm. you know or somebody you love, it doesn't really hit home. I mean, no. this is... Yeah, I have a very sad story, too, since we're telling them, Um, you know, because I am in that LGBTQ space and my Mm -hmm. heart's with those people. Um, I had a a mother write to me. It's usually a mother. And she was Spanish speaking, Hispanic, first generation. And she said her son, an adult, but a a young teenage boy, you know, I don't know where dad was, but um, the boy was having some issues, maybe with sexual orientation or identity issues. And um, sh- the boy was put, and I don't know how to phrase it, was put under the care of a priest. The, a priest took an interest in him mm-hmm. and the priest was abusive. Yes. So, I mean, it, it happens to a lot of people and, and people are kind of confused sometimes and say, well, you know, don't people know better? But it really depends upon the environment that you were raised in. Yes. And and some people are raised in an environment well where you're very dutiful and you're very respectful to the church, mm-hmm. to the hierarchy, and to um, to to uh, authority of the church. And yes. it, and it happens, and it doesn't just happen to minor children; it happens to adults as well. Oh yes. Yes. Uh, you know, grooming can happen to anyone. 
Of course, as I mentioned to you earlier, a predator is going to look for anyone out there that's vulnerable, whether it's a child, whether it's a male, whether it's a female, they're just going to look for someone that is out there that has had a lot of problems that is looking for guidance, that is looking for counseling, that is looking for someone to love them. And that's the first place that a predator is gonna go to. And they're gonna open their arms and they're gonna say, I'm here for you. I will love you, I will protect you, I will help you and I will guide you. And at that point, that's where the grooming starts. And if the person is vulnerable, they are probably going to end up being abused. And, and grooming is very subtle and it's, 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 I think people are confused about it, but what you said is very important is predators look for people that were vulnerable because I'm a survivor too. Mm -hmm. And I was a vulnerable person and they, and they really do seek out those people that they see as probably being susceptible to their flattery or to their attention. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you have to understand that when someone is sitting in a congregation and maybe, you know, you're, you're, you don't speak the language, uh, maybe you're, you're struggling to, with your income, you can't pay your bills or whatever, you're looking at the priest as someone that is just, uh, they're, they're treated as, as just, this is a, very respectable, very successful person in your community, probably the most successful person that you're around. Ed educated, yeah. Yeah, and, and when that person looks at you and says, hello, would you like to go to lunch? You're like, oh my gosh, this important person is inviting me somewhere, and of course I'd like to go. You know, and, and again, that's, that's what happens you know uh, first it's lunch then it's then it's this then it's you know let's take a trip together i would love to take you to the country to this retreat or whatever and it just goes on from there yeah yeah and a lot of times parents are i i, I think i think that's why i think this this sounds very nefarious and evil but i think it is mm -hmm. i i i think the predators in the Catholic Church know they can't get away with it with certain communities. So yes. I think for a large part, they are importing a yes. community where they can get away with it for the time being. Yes. So, yes. and I think that's, it's, it's incredibly tragic. It's, it's incredibly horrific. <laughs> well, you know, on a good note, I would, <laughs> I, I would like to tell you that at SNAP Houston, well, at SNAP period, SNAP, you know, our organization, we have really been doing some things that we're hoping will help uh, these communities, these Spanish speaking communities. For example, uh, last year, I was part of a, a drive that uh, they used my story for a drive to, to raise thousands of dollars, uh, which we did. We raised over $10,000 last year because our goal was that we were going to translate all of our SNAP utensils and materials, training materials into Spanish, which we have done. And of course, in doing this, you know, we would love to encourage now that people can read these things is to encourage people to, to become leaders in their different uh, states and towns. And to also know that you might, you don't have to speak English to, to be a leader. You can speak Spanish and we want to open that up. We don't want people to be hindered by the fact that they don't speak English. We want to arm them with the utensils that they need. We want them to know that there is an organization out there that can do that. Also, for ex the, the other thing is last year, I was very honored to be asked to be on the national board of SNAP. So ever since I got onto the board, you know, I have be become like a liaison into the Spanish speaking community. And what's really wonderful is that leaders from all over the country, whenever they get someone calling them that only speaks Spanish, they now will refer them to me here oh, nice. in texas and so i can you know translate but i can also get involved in in what they're going through and tell them about resources and stuff and of course they definitely feel much better when they're speaking to somebody that speaks spanish 
the other things that I'm working on right now is I'm I'm also working on uh, with a couple of people to open up uh, SNAP um, in 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 Spain and also in Lima, Peru, Ooh. and in in Mexico, and so we have really really been pushing in SNAP to open our arms to the Spanish speaking community. And we are hoping that people will contact us. For example, uh, I tell people we have uh, our national uh, website, which is snapnetwork.org. People can go there and find resources, but they can also, if they're looking for me, there's a, 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 si a place there where you can look for locations. So they can go to the state of Texas, and then my name will pop up there as one of the leaders. Also, my name will pop up as a, as a board member. So they, they know that they can contact me that way. They can also go to, uh, on Facebook, Snap Houston, and contact me that way and, and find resources there. And one thing we also did last year in conjunction with opening up more to the Hispanic community is that I established a Facebook page that is Snap en Español. Okay, specifically for the Spanish speaking community. So I'll, they I'll also, put it in the link to the video. Yes, I'll they put can it in also the link. go to that. And so, of course, and they can reach me individual, you know, uh, 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 personally at 832 641 6319. So we you're really are, giving out your phone number? Wow. Okay. Well, God bless uh, you. I have more than one phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. I, I have a phone and a number that, uh, you know, is specifically for that type of stuff. And, yeah. uh, you know, yes. But the main thing is, I want people to know that we are accessible. Okay. I'm accessible as a leader. I'm accessible to anyone who's okay. having problems. And they can call me, you know, 24 hours a day, which unlike I try yeah. to tell people what happens in the church. And I will, oh. I will tell you an interesting story uh, that I use now. You know, my, my beautiful mother, who's behind me, who passed away on the 21st of January. Uh, I come from a very religious family. I have two sisters and one brother. And my two sisters, basically, they, uh, they go to church like every morning. Mm -hmm. um, on the evening that my mother passed away, one of my sisters said, you know, do you mind if I call my priest? And I said, yeah, okay, yeah, go ahead. It's, it's fine. So she called her parish priest. And about three weeks before my mother passed away, he had, she had called him to come visit her one morning. So on the night that she died, uh, my sister called him. And after she talked to him, I saw that she was, you know, a little, you know, sad. So I said, you know, what happened with, with did you not get a hold of him? And she said, no, I got a hold of him. And he said that uh, he had already visited mom three weeks ago. And so he wouldn't come tonight. Wow. And yeah. of course, I, I told my sister, I said, I hope y'all see what the Catholic Church does. I said, our mother was 97 years old. She was totally devoted to the church. You know, she spent years giving to the church. I said, you all go to church every morning. I said, this priest did not understand that on the night, on that night, it was not about my mother. My mother was, my mother died. That was about him coming and comforting exactly. family exactly. because right. my mother had died. But, but to say, you know, I looked on her card and her visits are punched. She's, you know, she has no more visits. I mean, this is horrible. It, it is just horrible. And that's what Catholics need to know. They need to that, ask questions and they, be, they need to start demanding things from their religion. Eduardo, I wrote an article about this because I think a lot of people in the, in the United States, their eyes were opened a lot concerning the Catholic Church during the COVID crisis mm -hmm. when, when priests and bishops were not available, were yes. just not available for people like, like your mom who were, who were dying. Or it, and I have to say there was some good priests that I know specifically in my area were trying to be available to people who were in need. And mm -hmm. a lot of times the bishops found out about it and, and put a stop to it. 
Yeah. So it's it's it is it's very disappointing. Um, if if you have time, I wanted to talk to you about one other thing. Yes. Um, forty seven point nine percent of children who are sexually abused are revictimized as adults. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because it's a it's a bit about your story. If you if you don't mind. Uh, I don't mind telling you that uh, I was, uh, number one, my story starts, I was abused at an extremely young age. And uh, before I was abused by a member of the clergy, I had already been abused by uh, teachers that I had. Uh, I grew up, I'm from Galveston, Texas. So I was abused there uh, when I was very young. And uh, this was by multiple abusers. And what ended up happening was uh, my clergy abuse came after that because uh, my mother, um, she sensed that I was going through something and she, she didn't know what. So she began asking people, you know, can you help him? Can you talk to him? I, I need someone to help me. So of course, you know, who does she turn to? She turns to the church and she turns if, to the priest. If you don't mind me asking, Edward, where, where was your dad? Where was your father? Oh, my dad was, uh, he was still alive. At the, well, he died when I was 18 years old. But, he, you know, during the my abuse, he, he was alive. The only problem was, and I will tell you, is that um, back then in the early 70s, this is not a secret. This is not something that came out, you know, 40 years later. This is something that my parents uh, were very involved. They knew things were wrong in the school. Uh, when meetings were arranged with my counselors, my parents were there. They, they, they were there to help me, to, to back me up. They just did not know what to do. Is it a public school or Catholic? Public school, public okay. school. And Unfortunately, it was very easy because when I, uh, the clergy abuse happened, like I said, my mother basically just handed me to, to the priest and said, can you help my son? And of course, that's how he helped me. But by that time, and from then moving forward. Did, did, the, and, priest, did the priest know that you had been abused? Well, yes, because that's what I, I was there to, to okay. counseling. So of course, he, he wanted to know. We started wanted to know what was going on, what, what was happening, you know, in school and what was I going through and why was, why did my mother want me to go? Why did my mother say I was depressed and why did, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, again, you know, the problem is this person immediately knows this child is vulnerable. This child, you know, I can have this child like that. And that's what happens. Uh, going on to your question and when this is this may amaze you but in my schooling at Galveston Independent School District things were not treated the same way back in the 70s as they are now so I want you to know that uh, I was attacked by one of my teachers who started choking me on the balcony of a building with other students present uh, had me hanging over uh, a, a railing <laughs> Uh, why? Uh, well, it, 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 it's, it's why is the question. Uh, I got venereal disease from oh. one of my teachers. My God, horrible. Okay, so if you can imagine, if you can imagine going through those things as a, a child and telling people, okay, telling people, okay, I mean, you know, I was attacked, I was... You know, and nothing was done. In, in all of this stuff, my parents, when they went to the schools, nobody ever told my parents, you know, he need, you need to take him to the police. You need, you know, he was attacked by this guy. Take him to the police. No, none of that was done. My parents, again, unfortunately, they tried all they could, but we were not instructed to do the right things. I, as a child, did not it never occurred to me that I could go to the police and, and tell the police this happened. But what happens is, again, uh, you get totally disillusioned, totally disillusioned and, and 
you get to the point where it's like, I'm not going to, I can't tell anybody anymore. I'm tired of screaming about this. Then suddenly you find that you, you've graduated from high school <laughs> and you're going on to college. And for me, it was the only way I could deal with it. Of course, we were very poor. So my parents could not afford uh, counseling. So I never saw anybody. I had to figure all this out. Uh, I was my own doctor. But I went to Texas Tech University. And even though we were poor, uh, Texas Tech, if you, know, if you know the distance between Galveston and Lubbock, I was trying to get as far as I possibly could from Galveston. And Texas Tech was as far as I could go. Um, so, you know, that's what happened. Unfortunately, you know, that's when all of the, the things start unraveling. For example, uh, I went from being an okay student to a, a, somebody mm -hmm. that couldn't do things. I, I, once I got to Texas Tech, I could never read a book. Uh, I did not understand. Of course, I, I didn't know what was happening. I, I, but now I know that, uh, you know, since I was molested in early age in school, uh, reading books just remind me <laughs> of being molested in school. So I didn't know it, but I just could not. I would pick up a book and, and my assignments at college and I would read like three or four pages and that was it. I couldn't go on. Uh, I had to cram for my exams. That's the only way I could get through them because I could not sit there and be studying. Like I said, I didn't know what was happening. But at the same time, you know, the vulnerability, even as once I turned 18, the vulnerability is there. OK, because what people um, what is hard for people to comprehend when you've been abused is that since I was abused at a very early age, um, I got accustomed to those people doing whatever they needed to do with me. And because at the end of that, at the end of the, the sex, uh, I knew that. I was going to be hugged for a little bit. And that's what I wanted. I needed to know that someone cared and that someone was going to hug me. Uh, and then you go through the rest of your life after that, like that. And you say, okay, do whatever you want to, as long as you hug me after it's all over for, for a few minutes, as long as I feel that someone cares about me, then it's okay. And it's so hard, even as an adult, to, to, to finally grow up and say, you know, those things, you know, un unfortunately, you were, you were sent on the wrong path because of this sexual abuse. But, you know, it's taken so many years to be able to, to do this. People say that I'm very good with, with helping other people that have been through and that that I'm very innovative in what I tell them and that it helps them a lot but you know it's really interesting because it's like I told them I've been my own doctor mm. so the ideas that I have in my mind are just the ways that I have realized that this is how I have to deal with it because still to this point I've never seen a counselor uh, before I was let go from the church at Prince of Peace I was asked if I wanted to to see a, a to get help, and they said that they would, and then they never came through with it. You're you're pretty remarkable, Eduardo. I mean, for many reasons, but yeah, I've been in counseling for twenty years. I couldn't I couldn't unravel it. My much of your story resounds with me because, but but I think a lot of survivor stories are very similar. Is yeah. it? I I had that too because. But I think a lot of people on the outside have a difficult time um, understanding why child abuse, sex, ab sex abuse victims oftentimes fall into a pattern later. Yes. And, and I did too. I um, um, when In my early 20s, I met a Catholic priest who I told that I had been sexually mm -hmm. abused as a teenager, and then he abused me again. But then as an adult, and I and I've kind of dug through this with with counseling. 
is that I often repeated the abuse. I got involved with men who were like my abuser, older men who were very authority figures mm -hmm. who seemed very compassionate and uh, very understanding. And I got involved with that pattern over and over again. Yes. And, and for a lot, and I knew people that were also trapped in this. And for a lot of people, it doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. I think for most people, either, you know, drug abuse, alcohol, AIDS, because they, they, I think inside realize that they're just being reviewed again yes. and they're, and they're not finding that love that they want. And it's, 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 it's horribly tragic. And I think it's much more common nowadays than people realize. I really do oh, yeah. because yeah, I see people trapped a lot of times in these cycles of abusive relationships. And I kind of wonder a lot of times, gosh, what happened to them as a child? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, and I think it sets people up, you know. Yes. Well, the one thing that, <sighs> you know, I, I don't like saying this, but uh, whenever I get very close to a victim and we're having heart to heart talks, one thing that I do want to express to them is, and again, being my own doctor, this is what I've decided. I always tell them, you're never going to get well. Mm -hmm. This is going to be there and just face it for the rest of your life. The, thing that you need to do, which is what I try to do, is you need to learn how to deal with your everyday situations without getting triggered, without getting angry. You need to learn how to do that because it will always be there. You know, the only way that you're ever going to get rid of it is if you get hit on the head and have amnesia and then everything gets cleared and you have a clean state to start, slate to start over with. But most of us, that's not going to happen. So we have to learn how to be day-to-day -day people. Yeah, that's, that's, really, that's really truthful, Eduardo, because mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I see a lot of, I, because I have friends that um, are survivors of abusive childhood, and I just cringe a lot of times because I, I see them falling into a pattern. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't really... I've tried to guide them in, in mm -hmm. a, on a certain path, but it, it, like you said, it, it is difficult to be that brutally honest yes. with, with people because they are like fragile a lot of times and, and you have to, it depends on your relationship with them, how close you are to yes. them because that, that can be difficult to hear. And, um, and, and I think it's important too for people to hear that although survivors, their stories often are parallel and there's a lot of similarities but i think uh the in the telling of it it's there's always a diff there's always a difference and something unique about yeah. every person's because you know although the, i have similarities with your story mine are different in certain mm -hmm. ways where i th i think some people like i'm amazed that you you didn't need counseling and then some people have this is uh, one of the other tragedies is some people have very severe psychological um, issues, but you, you began the talk, like you, you've had a successful career and some people after this trauma are so brutalized yes. that they can't have uh, a normal life. Yes, and, and, and I've and seen you it. have to recognize when when you're going off of the track. And for example, I'll tell you that when when I went to Texas Tech when I got to college, um, I was it was it was wonderful to be gone from home, and I thought I had left everything behind. But it's really interesting because the first two years of uh, at Texas Tech, I had the most wonderful friendships that that i made in in college and uh one thing that was happening was uh, these wonderful people that came into my life eventually i was getting into fights with them mm. and of course at that time i was i was i was very hard-headed it was like oh well i had a fight with so-and-so but that's okay you know they, they can go their own way and i'll go my way and this just kept happening over and over and over again. And these are people that, that I, that they're, they're wonderful people and they were wonderful friends. So 
I, I, I couldn't figure out. I, I hated the whole world, okay? Because I'm like, no, there goes another friend and there goes this and that goes that. And um, I didn't realize that I could not get close to anybody. So when I would meet these wonderful people and they were just, we'd become very close and very good friends. And then it was me that was finding a way to get under their skin and fight so that they'd leave. Right. Yeah. Okay? Yep. And, and, and then one day I was like, wait a minute, this is just happening. How, you know, could it be me? You know, and then, you know, and, and you have to teach yourself. And I want you to know that I have uh, my best friend uh, to this day. Um, at, uh, at one point in my life, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not very tall. I'm like five feet. And I became friends with this person. He, he was like six, seven and became a drinking buddy. And we did all kinds of things. And of course, this person would see all of the friendships that I was ruining. And one night I was being myself, destructive self. And, um, this person picked me up and shook me for about two minutes Whoa! and threw me on a couch and said, that's enough. Wow. <laughs> and that was the moment that I suddenly said, okay, this is me. This is because I suddenly realized that this wonderful person in my life had had enough. And I was like, okay, here's another person that's about to leave. Uh, but fortunately, like I said, it, it, that's what it took. It took somebody just shaking the heck out of me. And suddenly, you know, it's like seeing your whole life flash before you and, and, and you're seeing, I have to now be a better person because I can't be losing these wonderful things that are happening to me and coming into my life. And again, you learn all, you know, I had to, to learn what, what is going on in my mind. And so I'm very good at having conversations with myself. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful because I've done the same thing. I was a good friend. Yeah. Um, to kind of wrap things up, I don't want to keep you too long. I, I wanted to get your reaction to, let's say, two things. So there was a survey that just came out recently, and I saw it on a lot of the Catholic news sites. Um, Latin America, um, in a fairly short time, it's gone from... 80% Roman Catholic, and it's down into the 60s now. Mm -hmm. uh, Brazil, which is the world's largest Catholic country, is soon to become majority non-Catholic. You know, wh why, why do you think? I think it has to do with, with just the abuse and people's needs are not being met. And, and evangelicals and Protestants have really moved into these areas, and they're meeting those needs that people have so well i think that the a lot of the reasons that this is happening is abuse is one of them but it's not one of the major reasons okay uh, and the reason i'm telling you is because when you're in latin america there's so little coverage of of, of abuse so right. that's not something that people are opening the newspaper or, or seeing on the six o'clock news what has happened is when people are dying, as people are dying in Ukraine, okay, uh, with the cartels, with the drugs, when people are randomly being beheaded, be killed, okay, now that is on the six o'clock news every day in, in those countries. They are seeing that, okay, and that's where you get to the point and you start asking that big question, you know, is there a God? What have these people that are being beheaded, what have they done to, to come to such a terrible end? And how can a caring and a loving God allow this to happen to innocent people? That's what people are waking up to in Latin America. They're like, something is not fitting in here. It's just not right. Uh, one of the things that I have uh, told people now, particularly my Catholic friends, is I tell them, look, you know, with the revelations uh, that with uh, Pope uh, Emeritus Benedict, 
uh, what he knew about sexual abuse when he was the Archbishop of Munich, and also what we know that uh, Pope John Paul II, who was a saint in the Catholic Church, what he knew about sexual abuse, I tell them, if you are a true Catholic and you believe in the ide ideology and the faith, then you know that the Pope, whatever Pope it is, is uh, chosen by, you know, Peter and Paul. They're, they're an extension of St. Peter. They're chosen specifically by St. Peter. I said, so if you're a logical person, then you know that when it comes to sexual abuse of children, um, John Paul II knew, Pope Benedict Emeritus knew, but so did St. Peter. And none of them have done anything. And, and Francis knew about McCarrick, so. Yes. Yes. And, and I think there's this, this ethos of suffering in Roman Catholicism, mm -hmm. which I think is good. I think redemptive suffering is a beautiful thing. But mm -hmm. I think, and, and this is the place that I got to, when I realized that the source of my suffering was the church. Yes. Yeah, then it, it becomes sort of intolerable. I mean, I can understand um, the necessity of suffering and the redemptive quality of suffering. But mm -hmm. when the church is causing your suffering, then no, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And that's when, that's when, that's when I had to quit. Now, how do you work? Because I realized that um, I've never really been a great advocate for um, ab ab abuse survivors. Not that I, I, I not that I haven't tried. I, I maybe I'm just not comfortable in, in that position, but I have tried to, um, demand or at least um, request that the church do a better job um, reaching out towards LGBTQ people. And I realized that if you're going to do that as a Catholic, you have to do that within the system. Mm -hmm. And within the system, it's, it's next to impossible as a lay person, because you just, I think in general, you just don't get the respect. That, I mean, you can try to co-op priests, you can try to talk to bishops. It's the, the bureaucracy is so big and so corrupt that it's nearly impossible for one person or even a group of people to effect change. And I, I just don't know. I think SNAP has. I think it has because um, I think one of the things that the hierarchy understands is money. Yes, and I, I think lawsuits get attention, yes. but I th I think politeness and letters and phone calls don't. No. So it, it's kind of, yeah, it's it's kind of like so. How that's a big question. How have you been able to affect change? How how have you been able to do that? I mean, as a Catholic, as a non-Catholic, as um, well, I'll tell you that, for example, here in in Harris County. Uh, last year, a $10 million lawsuit was filed on behalf of, of uh, a mother whose daughter was uh, molested by a priest in Victoria, Texas. That gets their and, attention. Yeah. Yes. That gets the attention. And, and this, this lawsuit names uh, our Cardinal uh, DiNardo, and it names uh, uh, the Diocese of Galveston, Houston, and, and uh, some entities in Victoria, Texas. Uh, now... What the, the diocese, for example, here, as in many cases around the country, what they are trying to do in this year is they're trying to get the lawsuit dismissed. So it's my, I spend a lot of energy and a lot of time trying to get as many people as I can to find out about the lawsuit, to put it on their Facebook page, to put comments, because what the diocese does not like is when word gets around and things happen okay and in another example i have a uh hispanic male here in houston who was abused as an adult which is very rare to to have an, an adult come forward Rough. and talk about their abuse and this is a recent case within three years uh now this person unfortunately is not a citizen they're cuban they don't speak English, 
And so this person has just been kind of like run over by, because the church again saw this guy as somebody very vulnerable, somebody that was not going to be able to get their act together and get things done. And so therefore then it becomes my mission because the one thing that this person wants to do is to tell everybody what happened to him. And so I, if, if I have an outlet, I tell him, go, please tell people what happened to you. Don't be afraid because, you know, that's what the diocese is afraid of. They don't like these stories to come out. And particularly in the Hispanic community with somebody Spanish speaking, they don't want that in the news. He was abused here in the United States. He was abused here in Houston at my oh boy. former church. That's, okay. yeah, that's what I'm scared about too, is that, that, but I'm glad that you're here, that people, especially with an immigration status that's complicated, they're just going to be very fearful to come forward. Yes. And the church, you know, they come after everybody. You know, we're people like me and anybody in SNAP, we're all targets because the church would rather have us not be here because we are such a big thorn in their side. But again, you know, it's, it's very interesting because the pandemic has allowed a lot of people to open their eyes slowly. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, I think a lot of people are coming out. They've had a lot of time to read. They've had a lot of time to get educated. Yeah. And they've also had a lot of time to look at their lives because when you are being threatened by a pandemic that may kill you, and you're seeing people around you die and you're like, okay, I could die next month. I could die next week. Then you suddenly start saying, I need to start paying attention to the downtrodden around me and give them more attention. Find out what happened to them. Find out if there's something I can do to make the lives of people that are suffering better. And that's what we're seeing. A new dawn as we come out of the pandemic is people are asking questions and a lot of Catholics are just not returning to church. You know, my favorite thing when on Facebook is, you know, when I'm talking about anything that's going on and in use, I always put, you know, hashtag the Catholic church in, in the Catholic church in decline because that's where we're seeing right now. And by the way, Maybe you can help me because one of the things that I'm trying to get the media involved in is what has happened um, since uh, the, the, the lists of priests came out and with all of the attention that abuse cases have, ha have, have gotten, you know, the donations, they diminished tremendously in the Catholic Church. I know of all of the parishes here, including my ex-parish, which was the, the huge parish, uh, every time I talk to somebody, I'm hearing about the programs that are being cut out everywhere. Well, no one is writing a story about all of the programs that are having to be cut out at different parishes, which is going on everywhere. So the media is just allowing the Catholic Church to go on saying, we're growing, we're wonderful, we're in fabulous shape, come, come to a Catholic Church. But that's not what's happening. I agree. I agree. I, I, my heart is very much with the Hispanic community, especially here in California, because when I was Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. I was so depressed a lot of times, is that I found in general the, the Mexican Americans to be so edifying. Yeah. I, I, I think spiritually, they, I was in a place much more closer to the, where they were, yeah. where are than the Anglo. I mean, specifically, I love our Lady Guadalupe. So did my father, God rest his soul. Now, I'm hoping there's there's a thriving culture there. Yeah. And I worry that the Catholic Church has a history of abusive tendencies, that that's a yeah. community that they will abuse. So it's, well, it sounds very pessimistic. I'm sorry, but. Well, don't, don't be pessimistic because, uh, you know, one of the models that I've live by now that I try to tell a lot of victims is that I find it that it's so it's so much easier to attempt to be Christ-like outside of the church than it is to try to be Christ-like inside of the church. Wow. Could you, you say say that again? 
that it is so much easier. You're taught in the church every Sunday in, in the homilies and in the readings. They're trying to tell you, you need to try to be Christ-like. That's why they give you all of these lessons about helping the poor, uh, clothing people, feeding people, doing all this stuff. Well, I find it so much easier to be Christ-like outside of the church than it is trying to be Christ-like inside of the church. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I do. I do. I think that's one of the reasons I left. It drove me crazy. Yeah. Is um I, I think I'm I think my soul is this is kind of like from Saint Augustine. I think my soul is a bit at rest now. Yes. yes. Um, because I just I still have the Lord, I still have our lady, mm -hmm. but I just don't have all of that noise. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, it, it, you know, uh, we always uh, the thing is uh I have learned how to make positive things out of negative uh, oh. things that happen to me. And I will also tell you, for example, you know, something that I know is, is going to change my life even more tremendously. You know, I lost my mother on the 21st of January. Yeah. Uh, she was, of course, as, as it is with any mother, she was my greatest fan. But more than that, she was my biggest support. Wow, yeah. And I had her here to, to, I could always come home to her when there was bad in the world or whatever. And I knew that, that she was there. And so now, you know, I have to learn. I have to apply everything that I've learned because this horrible, tragic, empty feeling that has come over me because of her loss, I have to learn how to make it positive yeah and it's difficult but i know that right now that's my mission i i have to make her death a positive thing i i, I understand because yeah i lost my dad five years ago and it's it's still tough it's i miss him a lot mm -hmm. i do i do yeah so yeah my heart is with you god god bless you yeah. Eduardo. And, and in those terms, I'm, I also want you to know that uh, uh, since o last October, I've been, I took care of her for 30 years. But since last October, I had given up everything. I was, I was with her, just or not with her at home, you know, just 24 seven. I was, I stopped traveling and everything since October to just be with her. And see, that's what I mean about it's easier to be Christ like outside of church. Because just like I gave up everything to be with her 24 hours until the day she died, and then to call a priest and the priest to say, I've already seen her once. <laughs> it's, I know that's devastating. That's absolutely yes. devastating. Yes. But, and like, unfortunately, that is not unusual. No, it's not. That, that's what we live with. And again, that's why our community gets abused so much because the Latino community does not complain. And, you know, we're not allowed to complain because of our parents. They don't allow us to complain. That's right. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. Right. It's yeah. But, you know, I have to say my dad, because my dad came from Sicily, he very much had that same that same ethos, which was work hard, you know, do your job, don't complain, just, you know, get yes. through it, get through it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's something to be said for that, but there's also a lot that can go wrong when you have that mentality. Yep. So yes, there is. And yes. people, yeah, people can definitely take advantage of that. Yep. So thank well, you, Edward. Thank you for the good work you're doing. You're definitely storing up your graces. So and I think you, I think you have them, and I think you're sharing them too. So you know, Mo, I have to say, all of the people that I have met, mm -hmm. no, I'll take that back. I have met some other people, but most of the people that I have met that have a great empathy and mm -hmm. compassion for people, you know, who have suffered this way, are those that have suffered themselves. Oh, so, yes. Um, yes. yeah, yeah, uh, you have to, because we're the only ones that understand. Yeah. You know, uh, some of us understand more than others, but we, we are the only ones that understand and we're the ones that can dig down deep into what is going on and, and 
we also know when to listen, when it's time to talk and when it's time to listen to someone. One other thing too is that, and I should have brought this up earlier, but I'll bring it up right now. It's, it's, it's a compliment to you, is that I've, I have compassion for victims and survivors, but I'm, all, I'm also very much often in a very angry place that can be not helpful. And I don't, I don't sense anything like that from you. I don't, I don't sense anger. Well, it's funny that I spoke to someone last night in an interview about that, about anger. And uh, I, uh, I told them, I said, I am not angry. I'm not angry at my abusers. I'm not angry at the church. I'm not angry at people that have walked down to my life, people that have unfriended me on Facebook. I'm not angry. I'm disillusioned. I'm very disillusioned. That's as far as I can go. Because if I get angry at all of the horrible things that people have done to me, I would be dead of a heart attack already. I cannot, I cannot put my body through all of that after all it's been through. I can't get angry at, at the, like the priest that wouldn't come see my mom the day and night she died. I can't get angry. I'm disillusioned. I can't waste energy on that, uh, you know, and anger wastes a lot of energy in your body. I, I would have been throwing things. Those are very, very wise words because it, it, it will kill you. It will. Yes. I, yes. Not, I, I think you're the first, except for my psychiatrist, you're the first person to say that is anger. You just can't live in that. You no. can live in it for a while, but not too long because I, I, I can testify it will take you out. It's absolutely horrible. Yes, it will. It will. And so, you know, anytime you want to talk or anybody wants to talk, please, you have a way to get a hold of me and I'd be more than happy to be a listening ear. Oh, God, God bless you, Eduardo. Much love to you. I'm, I'm sorry for the passing of your mother. I'm sure Thank she's you. praying for all of us. So. Yes. And please have everybody visit, it, visit, visit us at snapnetwork.org and see I'll, our page and all of the resources that we offer. I'll put those links in the video description too. Great. Thank, thank you, everybody. God bless you. And thank you, Eduardo. Good night.